Okay, so as you all just heard, the conference is being recorded, <laughs> and we'll, I'll be talking about that again in just a second. I'm going to start with, um, if you have any technical glitches during the webinar, you might want to jot down this phone number, 800-843-9166, that's the ReadyTalk helpline, or email them, help at readytalk.com, and just keep that handy in case you have any difficulties. We typically don't, but just in case, we want to have that. So again, I'm Terry Behrens. I'm the Director of the Institute for Foundation and Donor Learning and the Editor-in-Chief of the Foundation Review. And that's what I look like on a good day. Um, the, uh, this webinar is based on an article that appeared in our most recent issue of the Foundation Review, Issue 6.3, Using a Priority Grid as a Tool for Shaping Strategy and Building Impact. And the author of that article, Lori Fuller, will be our presenter today. The article is available for open access, so you can see the link on your screen. If you haven't already, um, I encourage you to download the article, share the link, and uh, pass it along. Um, our agenda for today is to go through some welcome and introductions. Then I'm going to just go through a little bit of housekeeping, and we'll um, turn it over to Lori for the presentation, and we'll have some Q&A at the end. All right, so during the webinar, all lines, obviously except the speakers, will be muted. I encourage you to use the chat function to send in questions, and you can do that at any time during the webinar, and I will be monitoring those and posing questions to our presenter at the appropriate time, and we'll have time specifically set aside at the end uh, for Q&A. Um, as noted, the webinar is being recorded. All registered attendees will get a link to the recording and to the slides. Okay, so I now want to introduce our presenter, Lori Fuller, who is the Director of Evaluation and Learning at the Kate B. Reynolds Charitable Trust. Uh, Lori has been there for about 15 years at the Trust. And um, just a couple of fun facts about Lori is that she is a proud foster parent and she is also a living kidney donor. Um, last year for Giving Tuesday, we had a, a major focus on um, organ donation at the at GVSU, Grand Valley State University. So nice connection there. All right, so I'm going to turn this over to Lori in one second. But I'd like to first ask everybody who's on the call to take, choose one of the answers on the screen here. Um, we'd just like to find out a little bit about how all of you are currently evaluating proposals. If this is not relevant for you, just answer no. But so do you have a formal written evaluation tool? Yes, but it's not related to our strategy. It might be you know, standard due diligence kind of tool or gee, is this a good proposal kind of tool, but not directly related to strategy. Or yes, you do have a formal tool and it is related to strategy and then, or no, um, not applicable or you don't have one. Okay, so we're seeing kind of an even split with um, those who do have a tool, uh, one that is, those that are related to strategy and those who are not. And a couple more people haven't responded, but all right, so that gives us a sense. So we are, are seeing some folks who are trying to more closely link uh, proposal evaluation to strategy, but there's obviously room for more work there. And so I'm going to turn it over to Lori now, um, who's going to share with you the work that she's done um, with the Kate B. Reynolds Charitable Trust on aligning their grant making with their strategy. Lori? Thanks so much, Terry. Good afternoon, everybody. I want to tell you a part of the story of the Kate B. Reynolds Charitable Trust and give you a glimpse of our journey over the past decade, which has really been about moving from being very charity oriented in our grant making and across our work to becoming more and more change oriented and impact oriented. We've made a lot of choices along the way through those various changes, and I'll focus on a tool that we've developed and called the Priority Grid. The Trust is a private foundation which is 75 years old. Our assets are over $500 million. We have a staff of 14, which most folks would say is small for that size and arguably could say that we should be bigger. Um, 
we have two different divisions in the trust. One is local and focuses on the county in which we're located in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. And the other is statewide and does grant making across the state of North Carolina focused on the quality of health and health care for folks that are financially needy. Our governance structure at the trust is not a typical one for many foundations. Although we were created from the bequest of a single individual, we're not considered a family foundation. And we also don't have a typical board of trustees. We have a single sole corporate trustee, which is Wells Fargo Bank. So that does change some of the pieces of our grant making process. It certainly changes our governance structure. But many of these pieces, I believe, are relevant, pieces of this story are relevant to other types uh, and other foundations as well. So to give you a sense of the picture, when I entered the trust in 1999, 15 years ago, and really where the trust had been for a couple of decades leading up to that, the trust was seen as, and very rightly so, as very consistent, very predictable, very steady, and as I said, it, it really was. The funding in the healthcare division was anything that fit in a very large box. You couldn't go outside of that box, but the box still left lots of room. If anything was healthcare, and it was in North Carolina, and it served the financially needy, then it was fair game for funding. It was eligible and, and could be competitive. Our strategy, although not made explicit, although not verbalized at the time, I would really characterize as we wanted to fund good people doing good stuff. That was really our goal and our strategy. We did that very well. We had refined that process. We operated much like a, a manufacturer and refined those processes, did the same things over and over, and, and had become quite, quite good at that. So that strategy all started to change in 2005. That's when the trust got new leadership in the role of our president via Karen McNeil Miller, our sole trustee at that point, Wachovia, which is now through transition become Wells Fargo, chose Karen as the new leader and, and gave her the, um, the charge to take us to the next level. Karen wasn't a banker, as many of the previous top leadership positions at the, held at the trust had been, had been held by former bankers. And Karen's leadership to take us to the next level involved starting to shake things up and see where we could make shifts. She began by talking about impact and influence and innovation, all three concepts of which we really had not been core values or goals that were embedded in the way we operated. So early on, we had a, developed a new tagline that was investing in impact. Folks were behind it, but we knew we had a lot of work to do to actually begin to start to live up to that tagline. So over the last decade, Karen has led us through several, several series, a series of several seasons of different strategy, each one getting a bit more deeper and more focused. The first phase, we knew we had a new leader, we knew we needed to move towards impact, and the first goal that Karen set out had to do with the allocations of our grant making, to double the grant making that the healthcare division did in prevention versus treatment in the healthcare area. So those things that help people before they are diagnosed with an illness or condition. We were funding about 20% just responsibly off the applications that came in throughout the year, and her charge to us was to double that. 40% would still be the minority of our grant-making funds, but it represented a substantial change. So this meant that we had to be more proactive. We had to start to make different types of grants. We had to develop relationships with new organizations that were unfamiliar to us, and we had to start to make more longer-term bets because that was simply the world that the field of prevention called for. So this is how we started to stretch our comfort zone. The next phase in the strategy for us with the healthcare division was to become more targeted and more focused. 
we did the surveys, we had conversations with folks, and everybody said, you've got to focus, you've got to choose some things. And of course, as we started to make those choices, it was also clear that most everyone also wanted us to select the issues that they were interested in. But the trust had to come internally and with our trustee, both the staff and the trustee. But in many ways, it was the staff that sat down and had those discussions of what could we pick out of all of the possible yeses that would be great things to focus on that we had experience in where we thought we could leverage some change in this state. We had to choose a small number, which also meant that we had to say no to other parts of the work we had done historically. We did it. We came to the point where we chose primary care, behavioral health and substance abuse, community center prevention, and diabetes, quality care related to diabetes as our four issue areas. And many of the staff at this point breathed a sigh of relief. They thought we had made it. Great, we've got a strategy. But Karen and the new leader at that point in 2011 of the healthcare division, Alan Smart, pushed the trust to go deeper with that strategy. And drill down into what we term as funding interest under each of those four issue areas. Actually, it's at this point only under three. You'll see that community center prevention really doesn't have the delineation of more specific funding interest within that area. Uh, we have exciting uh, news to, to us and I think to, to many of the folks doing that type of work in this state that in 2015 we will actually announce new funding interest in that area based on a partnership that we're currently working on a project with Active Living by Design to review not only our grant making in that area, but funding and work across the country in that area to make recommendations for us to develop our first set of funding interest in that area. The other three, though, we have had for, for a number of years funding interest under each that really represent what is the bullseye strategically, where we really want to play, and where we really want to make a difference with not just our grant making, but our other work as well. Our other work, whether it involves influence or being on task force or writing or other pieces of what we do every day apart from making grants. We want to have focused on this. The goals, the allocations goal that we've set to really uh, to kind of establish to us just how important this is, is that in our grant making, we want 80% of what we fund, 80% of our payout in the healthcare division to fall under these funding interests. So something that's simply an access to primary care is no longer good enough to meet our more sharpened strategy unless it is also either about increasing health insurance or health care coverage or helping get folks aligned with and connected to and provide services at a, through a medical home model. So that's our push to get the, the vast majority of our grant making in those areas. So we had set our strategy. Then we had to figure out how to actually make it happen because that really represented a, a pretty dramatic shift in, in our grant making. We had to figure out how to make it stick, not just a one-time announcement, um, how to operationalize it and embed it into our entire grant making process. How do we teach it to staff? How do we spread it across the organization? And we decided to create a tool to do that. This is the priority grid. This is after several versions is where we've landed. It's been, it's been stable um, for a number of grant cycles, if not a couple of years by this point. The tool is used for each application that comes through now both divisions of the trust. That's about 200 a year. So the program officer for each proposal will complete a priority grid and present it along with the application when the program team as a whole gathers to review each application and make funding recommendations to the trustee. We needed something in a tool, and don't worry about not being able to dig in and see some of the specifics here. I will go in and zoom in and highlight some of those in just a minute. We needed something that was simple enough and that would that the time would be reasonable so that it wouldn't create a burden during a time that is 
particularly busy for the program officers. It needed to have some clear anchors and definitions so that it was reliable in the ratings across users, even though we never intended to use this as like the score means that you will be funded or not. It's never been intended as the only factor in the decision making. It is an important one, so we wanted it to be reliable across folks. And you know, we really needed it. The whole purpose was to feed our grant making decisions. So it didn't need to be something that an exercise that you go through that's nice, but it's really not connected to what ultimately happens. And above all, those decisions and the connections between those decisions and this grid needed to be connected to our strategy. We were already quite strong in the due diligence aspect of grant review. We could go through and make sure across the board that applications were complete or whether an organization had a financial audit or whatever else might mean solid due diligence for any particular foundation. We did compliance really well across the board. We were shifting towards also including um, a way to live into our strategy and we needed a structure to help form the process so that our people could follow that and, and we could elevate that decision making process. The top of the grid is really the most important. There are three questions and of those, the most important is the priority, whether or not an application, typically it's whether or not an application follows in the issue area for example, primary care or in a funding interest under one of those issue areas, such as providing a medical home. This is the highest weighted in terms of points for a question, and that's certainly conscious. It's on purpose because this is where we start. That is the first cut. We also have applications that go even further in their level of priority. It might be because it systems change. It might be just kind of finely tuned, something that we know. And that funding interest is very, very important to our work. And that would merit a, a strategic mark, which would actually give that one, uh, that particular proposal, eight points. It's very rare these days that an application comes to this point and it's marked as a low and is not in, um, is neither in a funding interest or even in an issue area. The other two questions are a breakdown into two categories of how we're fostering our staff to look at impact. One is the depth and one is the scope, which could also be the breadth. So for each application, we're assuming that it's going to start in the middle, that most applications would be an average. Straight down the middle, they would be marked for both depth and scope of impact. So the program officer decides not just what the grantee or the applicant says they would accomplish towards impact if the proposal was funded, but what the program officer believes based on his or her professional judgment if this were, if this organization implemented this proposal, what would the depth of the impact be? How transformational it would be? So again, we start in the middle, but something that might be one time, if, say, sharing of health education information at a health fair would probably would be considered low depth of impact for us. Whereas a long-term home visitation program for nurse family partnership would merit a rating of high under depth because we would expect just simply a deeper change in that proposal. The scope is really about how many people are reached because we had had lots of discussions about programs that would have very deep transformational impact that might only serve a few folks. And to try to have both of those aspects of impact represented in order to balance our look at our decisions on funding grants. We added this second question of scope. Again, we're assuming, and most grants do, fall in the average space. Something might be low at an extreme if it was for, if it would target eight people with developmental disabilities living in a group home. Something on the other hand might be a high scope if it could reasonably reach all or the vast majority of the elementary school age students in a rural county. The bottom half of the grid is one that we probably played with and changed more, but again it has become stable as we've figured out how to make this work for us. 
it's a series of essentially bonus points based on other elements, aspects of our strategy, of our values, of what we're looking for that we wanted represented on this grid. This is one that is slightly different from one division to the other, whereas the top part about whether or not it's in our priorities and whether or not it has impact is, is identical across both divisions. So you'll notice that the first one is about Tier 1 counties. Just a brief explanation of that. That has to do with economically distressed counties. It's the 40 most economically distressed counties versus a Tier 2 or Tier 3 county. And that designation is done each year by our State Department of Commerce. So this is one way we get in the importance to us to be a funder and to make impact in rural counties because many of those, if not all of those Tier 1 counties are the rural counties in our state. We look at things such as if somebody has, is new or at least hasn't been around and in that grant making applicant pool for the past several years, that's in part because it's important to the trustee. The trustee wants to see that we're not funding the same hospitals, the same health departments, the same folks year after year. So we've put into place things that we wanted to look at and, and were important to us. And this could be completely different, obviously, from one foundation to another. So that's the tool. In many ways, that's the easy part. That's the technical part. It is connected to our strategy, which is the important part for us. But the so what question, especially the evaluator part of me, is, is the one that really matters. Has it changed our grant making? Has it improved it? How has it changed the way we look at our strategy, the way we implement it? I really believe it has done those things. It has changed our grant making and that its impact has gone deeper than that internally for us as well. One of the things that we now have because of the priority grid and the many repeated conversations of that priority grid are common definitions. You may have noticed the final question for additional consideration was, is it innovative? That word means very different things to different people. And so because this priority grid is done for every single application, and then the large group, the program staff and other staff that are involved in those funding recommendations, are all there for the presentation of that and then the discussion that follows. Is that really innovative? What do we mean by that? Well, we did another one and we said that was innovative, but we're saying no here. How, do we, how should we be consistent? Is this a high impact? Is this in our funding interest? What do we really mean by medical home? Having those conversations in, in ways that were relevant to the applicant, the application at hand, and also to the priority grid, helped us develop it and refine it, but even more importantly, it helped us understand it consistently in a collective way. And it helped us have those collective conversations, but also align ourselves with division leadership, trust leadership of, of how we were creating the meaning of these terms and how to apply it to the applications that we were receiving. I will say that now, although each priority grid is still presented, several years into this, there is much, there is much less conversation. Many uh, fewer of them, many less of them actually prompt that kind of conversation of, oh, I think that's low, no, I think that's a medium, or an average, because we have come to some group consistency and reliability. So in many ways now, it's the score, yep, most everybody or everybody agrees. It is less a visible part of our process or explicit part of our process. It doesn't take up the same amount of time as it did when we were all learning it, um, but it does still have a, a deep impact on the choices we make in our grant making. Again, it is, not, it is by far not the only reason that we'll make a recommendation. It is, it is an important one, though. Uh, for example, the uh, one that denials often are recommendations for denials could be low scoring, and the priority grid captures that reason. It could be that it's actually high scoring, and the reason that we are recommending for denial is not captured there, just because there's a, so, there's a variety of reasons why we might recommend that a proposal isn't the right, um, isn't the right 
place for us to go at that point in time. One of the, the key pieces, the positives that have come out of this that I know I wasn't anticipating in the beginning was that the priority grid has really served to give the program officers some guideposts for the strategic elements to consider in their work. They can align their work and start making decisions and shifting directions very early on from the initial contact with potential grantees or even developing relationships in the community with folks who may or may not become, become applicants in the future. So even at our initial screening phone calls with our program coordinator or the advanced consultations with our program staff, both of which are required for steps before submitting an application for our process, folks have, folks have begun to know and really incorporate into their thinking and their work what will make a competitive high scoring application, which for us is also, because it's connected, is also a highly strategic a body of work that will help us move our own work forward. Now I certainly know and, and support that the job and the role of a program officer is very complex and adaptive, as well as the, the role and the mission of funders. There are many more nuances to what makes a strong proposal, a good proposal, a strategic proposal, uh, than what is captured in this priority grid for us. But it is a representation of some of the core and kind of common strategic elements in our strategy that we want to ground our work in. The priority grid has really been one of the most significant learning exercises that we have experienced at the Trust. It now is and will be a training tool for new program officers and new staff as they come into the piece and the, join the team and become a part of this work with us. But in many ways, it's really about keeping us honest and being a reminder of the goals that we've set and to help keep us focused and compare things and assess and make those mid-course corrections to just make sure to keep returning to those goals that we've set and, and, and continue to push us towards moving towards those in a deeper, more full way. So that's the presentation that I ha have about the priority grid. Let me back up one. There's certainly more uh, details in the article, and I am I'm willing to, to also cover anything that folks might have an interest in asking a question about. Okay, thank you, Lori. Great presentation. Um, do we have a few questions? Um, one was, can you talk a little bit more about how the organization developed that shared sense of uh, of what makes a good project, a shared, strength, a shared sense of strategy. This, um, maybe describe that process in a little more detail. You know, there's different levels of the organization that that occurred, in which that occurred, and then different points of time. So the strategy being set, you know, in, some, in many ways was a collaborative process, and then leadership, you know, made those decisions, and there's this point, this line in the sand of, okay, we've, we've, we've wrestled this to the ground. Here are our funding interests. That still leaves some room for what does that really mean? What do we mean, for example, by a medical home? So those pieces would get clarified in a more solid and deeper and consistent way over the course of time through conversations, whether it was discussing folks that were calling in for an advanced consultation or, approve, or looking at recommendations for applications, multiple staff members would be in the room when different people would share their opinions of, well, I think a medical home is this. I'm pulling from this document or this work or this approach. We'd have debates and dialogue about that and uh, certainly what, the, what leadership in the healthcare division saw is that, well, this is why we're going to go this way because this is more meaningful, whereas going this way I think is not the right move for the trust. So we would build um, th that, those, 
those conversations would build into consensus, not all the way across the board, but consensus led by leadership as to what we meant and what was in and what was out. Now the fact that we had that discussion on what was in and what was out, what is in investing in a medical home or providing a medical home and what is out, we had those discussions 200 times a year uh, in two different chunks, two different grant making cycles. And everybody that was involved in that was at the table and for those conversations. So it really was the repetition, wrestling it to the ground, what we really mean. It's the foundation world is, is, is ripe for saying the large jargon words and people have their own ideas in their own heads, but it made us put all of that on the table, put it out in the room, and nail down what we really meant. And not that that hasn't shifted or grown or really evolved or improved over time, but it's really been about, sh it's, it's also sharpened and narrowed, and we have become more consistent. It's really the repetition of those conversations. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I have a question about the is the the role that the applicant plays in this, and I guess I, I have a kind of a two part question. Mm -hmm. Does the applicant indicate where they match with your priority areas and interests, um, yeah. or is that something a determination that's made by the program officer? And then the the second part to that is do um, applicants actually see this priority grid as part of the application process? So do they know what um, metrics they're being evaluated on when they apply? Yeah, fantastic question. So the, the funding interests are, are published with, uh, with some definitional sentences on our website shared with potential applicants. So they know these are our issue areas and under that here are our funding interests and here's what at least a brief explanation of what we mean by that. It is, a, it is a decision about, it is a decision that's made by program staff and not by the applicant themselves. This certainly comes into play with some of those initial screening calls of somebody saying, no, I'm really developing, this is really about developing a continuum of behavioral health care. And we have to say that we respectfully disagree but that the decision for the, for the funding area is ours, based on our definition, even though that may fit theirs, that we're going to put it through a filter of our own definition because it's about our strategy. Um, not that that's not good work, but that we have to decide where to focus, where to say no, where to draw some lines in order to move what we believe is the place where we can have the highest level of impact. So the program staff does choose that, um, although we do share those areas. We share not the priority grid specifically, although I mean, certainly having it's not um, it's not tightly guarded by any means. But we do share more at a higher level in our guidelines and in conversations of that we are interested in. Uh, best practices and things that are innovative and that we do, and you know, our guidelines will list more general terms that we're looking at the impact that applications will have. We don't, we don't typically share directly the very specific language that's in the priority grid. Okay, thanks. Um, could you talk a little bit more about the process that you used getting to those specific um, interests. Uh, so you, you, know, you started with your broad areas and then got down to the medical home, the, 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 for example. Um, was that a research-based process? Did you have consultants working with you in that? Was that um, staff we certainly, have, mm -hmm. we certainly have consultants working with us in that community center prevention area. That's one where the staff has needed that, that outside research and outside perspective to help us develop it. The others were really developed internally. It certainly was informed by research and data. It was also informed by our own history, places that we had worked deeply in and either decided that there were places we could go even deeper and have an impact and that our experience would be an asset or places where we decided we had really 
we had accomplished something, but various systems barriers or limitations made it difficult to, for us from our position and our role to make further difference. And so that might be an area that we said no to and shifted to places where we thought we could have more impact. You know, one of the, one of the decision making factors was of all, the, of all the places in healthcare, all the areas in healthcare that would be eligible under the confines of the will and, and in the legal aspects of what we could fund and where we could focus, one of the big pieces was where, where staff had energy, where we could dig in, where we thought this is exciting and we can build something out here, get engaged in this, in this uh, more complex work and make a difference. Mm -hmm. Okay, so they're kind of following the passions of the of the staff mm -hmm. was important. Mm -hmm. um, do you, you said you only have one trustee. Yes. Um, so I just I, so can you just sort of sort of speculate a little bit about what um, what the role of trustees might be in creating this kind of a tool? Um, do you see this as something that, in general, if a foundation was considering implementing something like this, mm -hmm. they'd want to get the trustees involved in the development of it, or just? Any right. thoughts you have about that? Uh, I think it would be you know, highly dependent on the level in which trustees in any given situation are involved in uh, not just the grants making, but the grants management process as well. Certainly, the, it's, my, you know, it's my belief that in many cases that, those, that trustees in, in different setups than what we, than what we have are going to be involved in setting the strategy. So if that's the way a foundation works and the trustees set the strategy, this could be a tool that the staff develops in order to reflect what has been set by the trustees, certainly a feedback loop of, is this what you were thinking? Are we bringing to you things that fit what you thought when you said X or Y or Z? Mm -hmm. Um, and that that could be a tool to help filter, bring things to uh, assess the recommendations, feed into program officers' assessments of, of those proposals. So I think trustees could, and, and depending on the process for any foundation, should be involved in various aspects of this. I think the, the reminder of what we have said is important to us and that feedback back to ourselves is, is just as important for trustees as, as it is in our case for staff. I will say that representatives from our trustee um, are a part of those large kind of program plus discussions where each application is reviewed. So in mm -hmm. some ways that has commonality comparisons to a board meeting with trustee members there Mm -hmm. and, and those recommendations are presented. So we're also showing here is how it is or isn't aligned with the strategy that we've created. And I would say, as most anything else, leadership is so important. So it was leadership. It was Karen McNeil Miller that said, create a tool to put this into play. Mm -hmm. So if, if the leadership is from the trustee for that part of operations and the buy-in is not there, that I, th I think that's a critical piece to the process. Okay, that's great. So there were a couple of other, you know, several other um, people who are on this webinar who indicated they had a tool that uh, they used to connect their grants to strategy. So I want to encourage any of you who answered yes to that initial question, um, send in via chat. Um, I'm curious how this compares with um, tools that other funders are using. I think one of the things that struck me about this is something that you talked about early in the presentation, Lori, that it's very simple. And mm -hmm. as your as um, foundation staff are kind of getting buried under that workload right at the, before the the funding decision meetings, those board meetings, that it's uh, <coughs> excuse me, um, keeping something that's really simple and um, you know that they will actually be able to fill out pretty quickly is kind of an important um, aspect of this. Mm -hmm. So any, and first, Lori, if you want to respond to that, any kind of feedback from the staff on the, how, the, how it feels to use the tool, that would be great. And again, encourage other folks around the call to send in via chat um, any observations that you have about how this tool compares to ones you're using. Yeah, staff, staff was involved in the development of this, so that also helps in 
not only the buy-in, but creating a tool that fit for what they needed as well. We did review at that point other tools that we could find. We continue to be on the lookout for those. I certainly found some that, that seemed very, very lengthy or would have such large spectrums, like 0 to 12. We knew there was no way that we could get our folks to be consistent about what an 8 was or a 4 was on a 12-point scale. And one of the things that we wanted to do, because this was really such a fundamental culture shift, to make grants not based on who we knew and knew well and trusted, who program staff had a relationship with, who we had funded for decades, and felt that it was really good work and, and that more amorphous sense of good work. We wanted to have some collective definitions of what good work meant for us and be able to have a trust-wide um, a trust-wide look at what at what that at what that meant and not be even though ind individual takes and the the professional um, skills and judgment and expertise of the program officer is so critical to balance that with a corporate wide strategy over where we're wanting to go as an organization with our work. So having that in the tool um, in a way that was also helpful for the program officers was important to us. Okay, great. So when you're giving feedback to a grantee on um, how, uh, how they did on a, on a proposal, do you actually like, give them their priority grid? Or do you... We don't. I, again, I, it's not that we're not open to that. I don't think it would be useful. And one, because the uh, if there is a if there is a if there is a difference of opinion back and forth. Of, oh, we're really high impact, uh, but the staff as a whole believes that it's actually not going to change the world. That it's going to have some impact, but not that transformational piece. That conversation has probably already been had. And to have it again is not going to make a difference in the score. Now we do, we do give feedback to applicants all along the way. As I said, our program officers meet with each applicant before they submit. So again, those conversations are happening then. They're happening during the kind of grant review process. And if there is a denial, those conversations happen then as well. So the information is shared. Uh, we, you know, we're cons your application wasn't competitive because after really looking at it and digging deeply, according to our definition, it really did not fit where we see our funding interest to be. Mm -hmm. So that is shared with them without actually sharing a specific you know, internal uh, technical grid. And, and it's also shared now with folks that are approved. Many of it's any type of um, interesting, substantial, a proposal. Most of our grants now have post-grant agreement meetings uh, after a post-grant approval meetings after a grant is approved. The program officer will sit down with those folks and say, you know, not only have you been approved, I want to share with you this is what the trust is particularly interested in. It's this aspect of the program, or this is why uh, this is what we're really going to be looking and with at and would mean success to us, even though we know that you have that and other things that you're looking at as success mm -hmm. factors for your program. Many of those conversations are also fed by and influenced by and relate back to elements of the strategy that are captured on that priority grid. Okay, great. Thanks. We have a couple more questions that came in. Can you discuss the scoring system more? So for example, uh, is there a specific score that grantees mm -hmm. must meet? Um, are you comparing grantees to others in the same cycle or uh, within the same interest area, or is it looking at all current applicants? Or mm -hmm. just a little bit more about how the scoring works. It is uh, you know, primarily about that grant itself, but also in relation to the grants that are in that cycle. It has helped us move our it has helped us move our discussions beyond, is this a well-written application? Is this a good project? 
to how does it compare to the others that we have in this cycle, we also have tried and have been very deliberate in putting into that process and into the culture here that it's not how much money, it's helped us move away from how much money do we have, let's fund the best applications until we get down to a cutoff score and fund um, as much as we can. Instead, we're actually comparing it what I'm trying to say is that we're also comparing it to what didn't come in that cycle and what other opportunities we would have for proactive funding. Just because the applications are there and it's a, an 8 or a 12 or a 16 or whatever it might be doesn't mean we no longer want to fund it simply because it's there and in order to meet our payout because there are other ways that we believe higher impact we can do that. So there's not a set score. There's not a hard line. What we do is go through each application individually. It has a score. That score, just like the priority grid itself, is embedded into Microsoft GIFs, the software that we use for grants management. And then at the end of those about four or five or six weekly, once a week meetings to review the applications for that cycle, the last step in the process is that we look at all of them together. We look at them in an Excel spreadsheet and we, we sort them by the highest rated to the lowest rated. And it also includes our initial funding recommendation to approve or deny. We go through those one at a time and make sure it makes sense starting at the top of reminding, okay, this Vance County Health Department, that was for this program. And this uh, one for the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, that was the one for that program. And we remind ourselves, one is to check that we've been consistent across uh, similar types of projects. One is to look for things that don't make sense immediately, such as a high scoring no or a low scoring yes. What has happened over time um, is that that process has become much quicker just as the process has become of presenting the individual priority grid. We present that, we go through it, the, the ranking of all of the applications and the initial decisions, and now change very few, if any, of those decisions based on looking at it in that kind of sort order. Again, because not only have our initial discussions started to align with and converge what leadership is driving for our strategy, it's been embedded into the process all along. So the applications are coming in are more competitive. Program officers have a better understanding of what would make a solid recommendation according to all of those elements. So it, it was a great, a great way for us to fine tune and train folks to show things show up. It's much harder to advocate for a pet project if it's scoring very low. Mm -hmm. um, where, so your passion, your, your individual and professional passion for that project now needs to be linked to those elements of strategy. And that's when, th that's when things really start to sync up and connect. So it is, it is not used as a cut score at all. Um, and we, it's really about making sure we keep our strategy lens on. Okay. So could you just clarify, <coughs> excuse me, I have two more questions here. Um, could you clarify, does the program officer, each program officer review all applications or are there do subsets of teams, you know, some team members review a subset of the applications or how does that? Right. Does In that, that healthcare work? division we have three program officers which mm -hmm. generally they cover roughly a third of the state geographically, although there's some exceptions to that based on types of applications. So when an application deadline happens, that set of applications is parsed out to those three program officers, often based on the ones that they already know because they've been in relationship and partnership in that community with that organization and they've done the advanced consultation. So most of the time program officers know what applications are going to come to them for that cycle. So they work up their caseload of pending applications. They then bring those to a larger group on one of those weekly review meetings, and they present their um, summary and assessment of that application and an initial recommendation and a priority grid score to a broader team, which includes the other program officers um, 
the other division, the local division, who, which is staffed by, by one person who operates as both the director and the sole program officer. So he receives and works up all of the applications that come in through the local division. Also in those meetings are the healthcare division director, often our president, at least two, mem or two members of our trustee, Wells Fargo. I'm in those conversations as the director of evaluation and learning. I'm often bringing elements to the conversation that relate to grants I have helped close out or review in the past, whether it's specifically from those applicants or from similar, um, similar types of programs. I may be the one that says, you know, this is a mental health program in a school system. This is what we've learned throughout um, our experience in those types of projects that are the key pieces that if they're not in place, it can, the whole project can unravel. Have you asked them about that? I am also the, tend to be the arbiter and the one about the impact scores, as well as what's become even more important now. What's important is not the scores. There's much more agreement on that. But what does it really mean? What do we, what do we really believe that this proposal would accomplish? What impact it would have? What difference it would make? And how will we know? How will the grantee know? How will they communicate that to us? How will we know? So it starts with a deep review from one person, but each of those applications is presented to a broader set of staff. Okay, great. So one, um, <clears throat> one person on the webinar here has commented that they use two reviewers, one staff and one volunteer, and they're actually going to be moving towards the process of using two volunteers to get some external and perhaps more objective assessment of the project. Um, has that been a concern for for your for the trust? Um, have you thought about having external reviewers as part of this process? We haven't specifically. The objectivity piece is actually one of the reasons why we developed the priority grid, so that it wasn't simply the assessment of one person, whether it's re volunteer reviewer or staff, saying. Uh, this is what the project does and this is what I think it will accomplish and this is, I think it's great. It at least, it, it at least delineates, uh, somebody has to say why they think it is great or why they think it is lousy. Um, and it gives them, it gives us a common language to talk about that. Now, in many ways that's also the, the objectivity, the priority grid serves some of that role. The fact that all of our grants are essentially reviewed by the entire group of maybe 10 people sitting around the table. It's not as in-depth, but we're much less concerned about what is actually in the application. We believe there's, I mean, that might be, say, 20% of what's important about that project. And the other, uh, the other portion is, is what, what we know and have learned and that relationship and what we know about the field in that particular issue area. So we're pulling lots in that is not even, uh, that it's not about how well the application is written or even what's said there. So we're also building on our own history and our own expertise. So that's, that's the way we're accounting for, um, we're accounting for objectivity. That's one of the reasons why I review all of the final grant reports after the program officer has in order to have another set of eyes, even if internal, to that process. So we are concerned about that, uh, and it's, again, very much why we, we did this, uh, the priority grid, as well as why we have other components in our process. It's just something for us. I will say, actually, in some ways the equivalent of reviewers for us, because we don't have a board of trustees, we have uh, to advisory councils that in many ways might feel like a board of trustees to the degree that they see the docket of pending applications and they give us advice, input, um, on the ground knowledge of things that we should consider as we do the due diligence for those organizations and those projects. So we also have that input source of ways folks can say, um, both positive and negative, and bring in different aspects and perspective to the work. Okay, great. Um, why don't you just get one, I'm not seeing any other questions that have come in so far, so I want to just encourage 
Everybody who's on the call, this is your final chance if you'd like to pose any questions before we wrap up. All right, seeing none, um, <clears throat> I want to thank you, Lori. It was a wonderful presentation. Really appreciated that. Um, again, this was part of our um, uh, series of webinars on the articles from the Foundation Review. Um, if you are not a subscriber, um, we encourage you to consider doing so as to support the journal. You can email Pat Manzer, the email address on the link there, and you can apply today's webinar fee to a new subscription. I did have one request to repost the link to the um, article, so I'm going to zip backwards here and get that up. Um, oh. Nope, went too far. So again, we will be sending a link to the webinar and the, um, there we go, a link to the webinar recording and to the, um, the slides to everybody who was on the call. And again, here's the link to the article. I encourage you to read that and share it. Once again, thank you, Lori. We really appreciate your contributions and a great, great webinar. And um, thank all of our participants. And that concludes the webinar. Thank you.